Um, I'm going to start with a quick story. It's a true story. Um, so my first job uh, was working on a building site. I was 14 years old. Um, please don't tell the tax man. Um, and uh, I was working with six other guys that were a lot older than me um, and basically I was there to sort of fill in the space so they had enough people for the team to do the job. So we were working in North London on a uh, council estate, we were repainting the windows and doors and at the end of the week a guy from the council would come round and would check to see uh, what, what the, the quality of the work that we had done, and then uh, and then we would get paid. So, so the week goes. It's really hot summer to, summer's uh, week uh, <laughs> time. It was brilliant, and I uh, made some friends, etc., etc. And then uh, so the guy comes from the council on Friday afternoon, and he says, "Man, this is rubbish. I mean, we're not paying you." And it so conspired that. Um, the five of the other guys had criminal records and they had all met each other inside prison. Um, they were subcontracted out, so one of them had managed to get the job and that meant that we could, uh, that they could legitimately work um, and now they weren't going to get paid and I didn't get paid, so we were all really upset, I was going to use another word then. Um, and it stuck in my mind because about six years after this, two of those people um, actually got life sentences for a series of armed robberies that they had committed. That at the time that I'd met them, they were trying to have an ordinary life, earn money, they had families to provide for, and yet, um, it's also what they ended up back inside. Uh, so, uh, I have a bit of a chip on my shoulder, well, particularly when I was a kid, I was nothing like this kid, um, he looks crazy, um, with chips up his nose and ears, but one of the things that I um, felt, and it was really sort of uh, put up on me as a young, a young guy growing up, was that I needed to get a job needed some security and I worked very, very hard at school and uh, I uh, went to university, um, studied at Glasgow University, it's a fantastic place, um, did very well there and got a scholarship to go to Cambridge and carry on with my research and then at that point um, I got another scholarship, I got two, I went to Oxford, yeah, I was doing great, so I thought. But actually, the problem was I um, was gone. I had gone too far into academics, and I actually didn't want to be an academic. And I had all this guilt about undertaking research in a social and economic history of the art market in London, 1660, 1720. It's riveting stuff if you like that kind of thing. Except, actually. Only five people in the world are particularly interested in that kind of thing, and it wasn't enough for me. So I um, thought to myself, well, what the hell am I going to do? I've never done anything else but study, research, and work hard. I don't have any skills. So I took a year out, and I worked in the charity sector. This was 2013, and it was a really, really... Um, bad time for charities because we have five years of recession and charities go into recession first, they're also the last to come out of it. So by this time funding was at a rock bottom. And what I was doing, I was working with a homeless charity and I did a lot of uh, interaction with smaller homelessness charities around the UK and I remember one statistic um, for a charity that I was liaising with here in Glasgow where they were 100% grant funded and before the recession uh, they had a 1 in 5 success rates for their grants and now it was a 1 in 20. So they had to do 5 times as 
as much work to be funded to do exactly the same job that he had done previously. And I thought, this is crazy, this is nuts, this is, this is so messed up. And I thought, it's fantastic, what a great opportunity ahead. And uh, I've got this sudden desire that I could do something useful and something good um, for myself, but for, for other people as well. And I dropped my PhD immediately. And I started to think about what can I do um, that could be good for people, that could engage with people. And I sort of hit on this idea that the thing that I love more than anything in the world is comfort eating. I eat a lot. Well, if I wasn't such an anxious, wound up guy, I, I wouldn't be this skinny. But, I thought about it a bit more and I thought it's great because um, food is something that can create jobs because we all eat in food. It's something that's quite social, we can share it. And at the same time, it's something that uh, we can take back home. People can see what skills we have. It's not just a job that we leave at the office. Um, that is meant to show you a statistic. Um, for every person with a criminal conviction that uh, gets out of prison, manages to get a sustainable job and holds that job down for five years or more, the Scottish taxpayers save £940,000. That's a government statistic. I don't believe it at all. But the point is, it shows that there's a big big problem and the correlation between um, employment and people not reoffending is a very high one. In fact, reoffending rates in the UK, though they're marginally better in Scotland, are still double uh, or around double that of any other European country. So I thought about this a bit more and I, and I thought, well, we could set up a food business and maybe bread is a good idea because it's simple, it's just flour and water and yeast and so on. And everyone eats bread um, and yeah, let's go with that. And the other thing I thought was, no one's going to get food poisoning from this. <laughs> so, I've got one for you, right? An Englishman, an Irishman and a Scotsman. But you heard this? An Englishman, an Irishman and a Scotsman walk into an organic, highly reputable coffee chain and we figure, why don't we set up a bakery inside a prison? We can train people while they're in prison and we can send the bread out to create revenue that will fund the training activities. And that's exactly what we did. We set up in this prison shown here, Low Moss, which is just outside of Glasgow, um, as we affectionately call it, the Death Star, because um, it looks like a spaceship from, from out, <laughs> if you're flying in a plane over the city. And we set up a very small little bakery in which we started to train guys. It was great, it was really fun, and very, very challenging. And we started a very small wholesale trade well, the problem is, actually, didn't really think about it very much. And working in a prison is really hard. There's security everywhere. You can't even move around. It used to take half an hour to get a van through into the compound, to get it loaded up with bread, and then send it out again. And another thing is that people um, with a criminal record, they can't we can't give them a job so easily. Um, in fact, there's a law that prohibits, well, allows companies to prohibit applications from people with criminal convictions and just uh, write them off there and then. Well, surprise, surprise, fewer, not many people with a criminal record get a job. So, and the worst thing was we were going broke. <laughs> so we rethought the plan and we put together some investment and opened a new bakery
just in the north of the city. We did this in May 2017. And the idea was now, out of prison, we could actually provide not just training, but we could take people into employment and give them jobs as they're coming out of prison, which is when things really go bad. Um, because when someone leaves prison, they're, like, they're very likely to re-offend within the first week of release. More often than not, because they're legally homeless. So we, we built up the business and um, we started having prisoners come out to do their training with us. Um, this picture shows you two people. One's a professional baker and one's a prisoner. Spot the difference. You can't see one. Basically, the idea was to always just blur the lines. There's no them and us. You're a baker, you're a baker. And it was very important because having that identity means that people feel that they're not a prisoner anymore. And they become more interested and they see this as something very positive and they latch on. And we do really well. We always had this approach, however, that the, the altruism involved was very much um, in line with what we were making. We wanted it to be the best. We really wanted to prove that some of these people who have uh, come from the worst backgrounds could actually achieve, and achieve really, really well. And the more that we created something for the public that they wanted, that they liked, they appreciated, then the more we could grow our business and expand what we were going to do. And that's what we did. From May 2017 when we started trading in that new bakery until October last year, we had increased our revenue nine and a half times over. And that has allowed us to scale rapidly. A third of our staff are people who are in prison. And of the 32 people that we have trained inside prison, um, only one of them has ever reoffended, compared to a 42% reoffending rate, which is the, the Scottish uh, statistic. So, um, what have I learned? Well, I did everything the wrong way because actually I didn't really think very far ahead. I was always just pushing an idea out there and uh, usually doing something wrong. But the key is to react and to, to work with what you are given. So make a mistake, learn from it. It doesn't matter. And we are working with people in prison and they are in a situation with us which they would never be in. It's unique in the sense that it has nothing to do with prison at the end of the day. We're not there to discipline them or um, act out more justice on those people. The only justice is trying to see that they achieve and succeed. And we're, do, we're doing quite well at the moment. In fact, we are looking to expand again. Anything up to a million pounds we're seeking as an investment to open a bigger bakery and to open a charity, which we would put our profits into and then do more and more work uh, in the prisons itself. Um, so, it's been quite a journey, but uh, um, I'd like to say that, uh, yeah, we're doing very well. Thank you.